Good evening, KZFR. Hopefully everyone is having a good night tonight. This is going to be a pretty interesting show. Um, we have a lot of kids with us from the Butte County Homeschoolers Association and uh, a few teachers and parents were, were packed in like sardines at this point. Um, but uh, the pieces tonight, because we have so many people, um, are, are very deep, inspirational pieces that are, are they're going to be a joy to uh, hear for the first time on my end. But I wanted to let Rachel, the teacher of the group, speak first because um, there's some background to these pieces, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, this group here of 9 to 12 year olds uh, is a part of a project-based learning uh, group, which is a subset of farm school. And these kids could have chosen anything to focus on, any big project that we could have taken on. <laughs> Uh, we could have picked from uh, some of our options. It could have been salve making and selling. It could have been um, zip line. And these kids really wanted to take on uh, social justice issues. And so uh, before the fire, we, um, they had come up with wanting to reach out and give a welcoming and learn more about the Honduran refugees and also be a part of a peace march. And so we'd been um, putting out feelers to be a part of the MLK Unity, MLK March in January. So what I'm hearing is these kids are all super amazing and remarkable human Super beings. amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. And then we had the fire and we had a break from school. And when we came back, um, not only were we thinking about um, and wanting to support the Honduran refugees still, but then we had some people in our class who were now refugees. And so the, um, our project just began to shift a little bit. And so what you'll hear today is a, a combination um, of that process. Very heartfelt pieces. We talked a little bit beforehand, so I know kind of what's upcoming. Um, but I think because of how many people we have, we should go ahead and just dive on in. So I have kind of a list of people here. I think the first person was going to be Olya. So if you want, um, if you have a title for the piece, you can go ahead and hop up here to the microphone and let us know what your title is and maybe why you wrote it, what it's about. Hello, my name is Olia Carroll, and I'm going to talk about the Honduran refugees that I wrote about. Wonderful. Hello, my name is Olia Carroll, and I am nine years old. I am here to talk about the Honduran refugees are having to leave because they do not have good weather for their food to grow. The weather is bad because people are oil mining and also spraying the sky and using gas. What we could do to, you, to help them, we could stop by driving cars a lot and eating locally, which helps by not using gas to drive to where we need to go. To they, because they are facing violence and also are afraid of being kidnapped. As they travel to the U.S., the refugees, they are hungry and cold and it is not easy for them to travel. They want to make the U.S. their new home, but we have lots of food and houses for them. Trump, our president, is being mean and he does not care. I think I've talked to like adults who have less um, empathy than you do. This is remarkable. That is a very good piece. Thank you very much for reading that. I think we might come back to you, but uh, for now, let's go ahead and, and keep moving along here. So uh, Issa, is it? We'll have you read. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, my name is Issa Tupi, and I wrote a story that I based on real facts about the Honduran refugees. This is a story of a little girl who is a Honduran refugee and her journey through Mexico to the USA. My name is Cora. My family and I live in Honduras. I live with my mother, my father, my older brother, my younger sister, and my baby brother. One day, mother and father decided to leave Honduras and go to the USA. You may wonder why we should choose to leave and go so far. Our village happens to have many thieves, and we have been robbed multiple times. Plus, there are people with guns, kidnappers, no good jobs, and no school. Many others have chosen to do the same. A group of people will be traveling with us. My best friend Maria is coming, and many others I know. I'm glad Maria will be coming. We pack whatever is necessary and as much canned food as possible, because any other food will spoil. 
The men take the lead and the women and children follow. We must walk for we have no car or money for a taxi or bus. We stop in several villages for food and water. Some of the people are nice and welcoming, but others are not. My feet are sore and have many blisters. When we finally get to the Mexican border, we are met by Mexican police officers. We ask to come in and they say, wait here and run off to tell their boss, I'm guessing. He comes back to tell us, yes, you have been given access to enter. It is getting dark, so we decide to set up camp for the night. Sis my sister and I are sent to get food. While we are there at the store, an older lady comes toward us. She asks if we were lost. I replied, no, our parents are setting up camp. We are walking from Honduras to the USA. The lady asks if we need a place to stay. And I reply, si, si, yes, gracias, thank you so much. De nada, dear, you're welcome. She gave us her address, and my sister and I rushed to the camp to share the good news. We decided that the woman with babies and younger children would stay at the lady's house. Marie and I slept on the ground with one blanket. Even with the blanket, we were freezing. In the morning, we packed up and started walking. That night, we weren't so lucky, for everyone had to sleep on the ground. A couple weeks later, we were running low on food and money, and to make things worse, it was almost the rainy season. We were, we were starting to panic. Three weeks later, we had eaten all our food and used up almost all our money. The next day, we had our first rain. We rushed around, struggling to put up tarps. For the next few days, we stayed under the tarps unless the rain lifted. Then we would search for food. The next sunny day, we started walking. The next day was sunny, too, so we kept going. We went fast and feared the rain. That night, we were all tired. A group of men decided to keep going, for we were almost there. The next day, we made it. I was overjoyed until we asked to come through. They wouldn't let us. They said they had orders from their president not to let us in. I was furious. The next day, my brother and father, along with others, decided to try to charge through. They came back with stinging eyes from tear gas. And that is where I must leave my story, for that is where I still am. The end for now. But maybe with your help, we can give this story a different ending. How can you help? Write a letter. Send some food. If you can't do that, then send your hope. So first off, yeah, clapping is a good, a good thing at this point. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, this is not based, I mean, it's, it's based on a true story, obviously, but this is something you wrote yourself. Yeah. Very, man. Natalie, what do you think about this piece? Um, you kids are intense, but I'm really impressed by you. Uh, your level of compassion and just the fact that you can enter the mindset of a, a refugee like that is, I don't need, I'm speechless. She's rarely speechless, by yeah. the way. So <laughs> this is very remarkable. Man, that is a wonderful piece. I, well, we might come back to this again, depending on how, what time we have, but let's go ahead and, and move on to Morgan. And thank you again. Hello, my name is Morgan Reiser, and I wrote a piece on the Honduran refugees and how they walked from their country, Honduras, to the USA. How would you feel if you walked hundreds of miles to get to a safe land, but when you got there, you were met by border guards and not allowed in? Well, that is what is happening to the Honduran refugees right now. Many of the people walking are families, women, and children, escaping life or death situations and poverty. One of the dangers Hondurans face is gangs. Gangs make it unsafe for everybody. Gangs will harass people of all ages to become a gang member or a kind of gang slave. The danger of this is too great for some families to stay in Honduras. And they felt it was worth the risk of the long trek to the U.S. Honduras to the U.S to seek safety and a slime. They knew the walk was very dangerous, especially for women and children without doc documents, but they also felt like they had no choice. Now that the refugees have reached the U.S. border, they are trying to get across, but the border guards have stopped them. If they do get across the border, which not a lot have, they will still face challenges. They will need to try to make a living with all they have, which is not a lot. And if they did not get in, then they are still sitting there waiting for a better life that is so close yet so far away. I have to just kind of let these sink in and, and hit me because these are, these are amazing pieces. I mean, great job, Morgan. My gosh. So you, you detailed especially, um, I mean, each, each of you is hitting like different parts about what these refugees are dealing with. Yours specifically hit on the danger of what's going on in Honduras, why they're leaving. Um, between the three of you, you guys have, have really detailed what it feels like to be a refugee, I think. That is, that is something that um, 
schools, universities are dedicated towards doing, um, and they often miss it sometimes, which is why we have problems like we have now, to be a little bit political on that end, I guess. Yeah. Um, but your pieces are absolutely phenomenal. Natalie, anything you want to say? Uh, I agree with you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Good comment. Um, well, I know we have a connecting piece here. So, so these were the Honduran pieces, and now we're going to segue into some of the campfire pieces. Um, and it was Jonah. Haha, -ha, I got it right this time. <laughs> All right, Jonah, go ahead. Tell us about your pieces. Hello, my name is Jonah Labar, and I wrote a paper on refugees of different kinds. Um, this is it. Did you know, in 2017, there's 65.6 .6 million refugees in the world. A refugee is someone who's running from their homeland due to persecution, violence, or the environment. Right now, there are refugees from the campfire. The campfire was a big fire that started in Polga and burned down to paradise. The whole town was destroyed, and over 80 people died. Many of my friends' homes have burned down, and they are now temporarily living in Chico, Orland, and Oroville, and some have gone farther. Mm. Our community, oh. They are environmental refugees. Our community has welcomed them by giving out free food, homes to stay in, clothing, and money. There are, many, there are other refugees right now coming from Honduras trying to enter America. They're escaping poverty and violence. They're hoping to find safety, jobs, and education. At the border, the police are tear gassing them and using rubber bullets. I want to help both groups. As it says on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. This is what America stands for, so why aren't we doing it? Oh, man. Having call to actions at the end of, of writing, um, I was once discouraged by a teacher a long time ago, don't have any call to actions, don't do that because you don't want to evoke anything. And I immediately thought, what's the point of writing then if you're not going to try to inspire someone or, or, or evoke something, some sort of emotion? So that piece um, points out issues and things that we can do. And, and the fact that you ask people to do things about it is amazing. That is a really well-written piece. Very good job. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next one is, is Jonas. Did I get that right? I'm nailing them. Perfect. Hello, my name is Jonas. I am nine years old. My family's house burned in paradise. This is my story. When we woke up that morning, the sky kept changing. Sometimes it was glowing orange and made everything look pink, and sometimes it was so dark it looked like it was midnight. We weren't that worried at first because we looked on the computer and it said the fire was far away. Ash was falling from the sky just like snow, and we were having fun catching burned leaves and sticks that we thought had blown all the way from Concow. My dad called from work and said there was another fire in Megillia at the dam and that we should start packing up while he came home to help us. When we were evacuating the fire, we could not find our cat, Kitty. I was really scared. Soraya and my sister saw a fire in our yard. We put it out with the hose and started throwing stuff in the trailer. When we drove out, my dad had to get his friend's dogs, so he had to go in a separate car. I was worried because I wanted him to be safe. Then there was a big traffic jam and the sky was orange. At the bottom of town, there was fire on both sides of the road. We saw people's houses burning. There were power lines that fell in our lane and it was hard to see anything from all the smoke. When we were sitting in the truck, we could feel the heat from the fire through our windows, even though they were rolled up. It was so hot it melted the blinds in our trailer. We saw a lot of cars on fire. Some of them just had their tires on fire. When we, got, when we finally got out of the smoke, we could see that it was morning, and we looked back at the big cloud of smoke over Paradise. Just before we got to Chico, we could see our dad's car and followed him to his work. Then we ate pizza. Next, we went to Grandma's house and slept in our trailer. A few days later, we stayed at a house in the suburbs. It was boring. I missed Kitty and our chickens and my fort and having space to play outside. Now we are in a new trailer at Kara's house. It is fun. My friend Nate is here and they have farm animals. We made a new fort and we have lots to do. I hope that when they let us go back to paradise, we can find Kitty and that she'll be okay. I'm thankful for all the people that have helped us and that we're all safe. A lot of the times when, when these events happen, things like really bad things happen, um, it's really easy for people to just kind of gloss over them and just see it as an event that happened. Um, and I wanted to really point out um, and say thank you for, for giving us those details because that's something that is uniquely yours. Your writing is amazing and, and what it's kind of given us 
is your perspective of what happened in that moment. You've given us the details of that event. So that way people who listen to you don't just hear an event that happened, they see that it affected you as a human, which is something that is, is very profound. And I, I, I thank you a lot for that. Thank you. I really appreciate the bits of hope in there too. And it really touched me to just kind of see that you could capture those moments and not there. I didn't feel like there was anger or, or a lot of really just mixed feelings. You just kind of really detailed your experience for us so that we could be there with you. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Sam, was it? I'm still getting right. I got it. It helps writing it down beforehand. Um, so go ahead and read us your piece. Okay. Hello, my name is Sam Holden. I'm 11 years old. My family lost our home in paradise. This is my story. It started as a normal day. I woke up at 7.30. My dad and my brother Jonas were talking about the way the sky looked. It looked like a sunrise in the clouds. We knew that meant there had been a fire somewhere, but there had been fires all summer, so we didn't know it was so close. My dad left for work, and we started our normal homeschool day. My little sister, Sarai, went outside to see her friend, Elena, and ran back in yelling that it was raining blueberries. We went outside, and it was raining ash and burned leaves. I even caught part of a tree branch. We looked at online, and it said the fire was in Konkau and Polga, so we thought we didn't need to worry, and that those charred leaves had just blown a long way. By that time, the fire was already in paradise, and we had no idea. Jonas started doing his speech class online. His teacher asked why it looked so dark. He told her there was a fire, but it was really, really, but it was really far away. Our dad called from his work in Chico and told us there was another fire at the dam in Megalia, and he was coming home to help pack. We packed our backpacks with a few clothes and what we would need to spend a few days at Grandma's house. When we were packing up, we didn't think that our house would actually burn down. We just thought we were going to Grandma's house for a few days while they put out the fire. I used to have a kindling business, and I had about $400 in my dresser that I left. And I had a really cool collection of old coins. A lot of them for, were from my great-grandpa. I was also working on a golf cart that I was excited about, but I'm pretty sure that burned up too. When my dad got home, he packed up lots of things in our trailer that would help in case we got stuck on the road somewhere. Things like bikes and a bike trailer so we could still get out of if the roads got blocked. When my brother and sister and I were packing, all of a sudden my little sister Sarah yelled, fire! There was a fire in our yard right outside our bedroom window. It was about the size of a campfire. It started from embers falling from the sky. We ran to tell our parents and they put it out with a hose. Then we knew we really had to go. We pulled the curtains down from the windows and moved the furniture away from the walls. Our whole street was blocked up with cars. People were yelling and honking and we kept hearing sirens and big booms from transformers blowing. It sounded like a battlefield and they were getting louder and closer. The sky was completely black like midnight. It was hard to remember that it was morning. Just as we were leaving my dad got a text from his friend from work. His dogs were locked in his house and no one could get up to paradise to get them. My dad left in his car to get the dogs and my mom and I and my four younger brothers and sisters left in the truck pulling the trailer. We planned to meet at my dad's work in Chico. There was lots of traffic, and we saw people riding quads and dirt bikes and even a go-cart cart on the side of the road to get out. It kind of felt like the zombie apocalypse because traffic laws don't, didn't matter anymore. All the traffic lights were blinking, police were telling people to drive on the wrong side of the road, and my mom was nursing my baby sister while she was driving because we had been stuck in traffic so long. We saw mom walking with her little boy because they didn't have a car. A policeman stopped an older lady in the car in front of us and put them in her car so they could get out safely. When we finally got to the bottom of town, a guy told us to roll up our windows because people's cars were catching on fire up ahead. We thought he was exaggerating, but when we got to the health center, there was fire on both sides of the road. People's houses were burning and all the trees were on fire. When I looked up at the hundred foot trees burning, I was worried they might fall on us. We could feel the heat from both sides through the windows of our truck. We almost hit some power lines that had fallen in our lane because the smoke was so thick it was really hard to see where we were going. We saw, we saw cars catching on fire as people were driving. We saw a shell of a truck in the middle of the road that was in a huge fire. Some people were pulled over because their tires caught on fire. I tried to take a video with my mom's cell phone but I was crying a lot because even though my house wasn't on fire, it was all the things I had known my whole life that were burning.
When we finally got out of the cloud of smoke, we were surprised that it looked like daytime again. We saw news reporters filming the giant cloud of black smoke and orange glow of the flames that had gotten so big. When we got to Chico, all the roads and gas stations were full. We met my dad at his work, and there were a lot of people from Paradise there. We all talked and listened to each other's stories. We stayed there a long time because we heard the roads were all blocked up. Then we drove to my grandma's house in Palermo and parked our 18-foot camping trailer there to live in until we could go home. On Friday evening, one of our friends that's a police officer texted that he had driven by our house and it was gone. That felt really weird to think that we were never going back. It made me sad because we lost everything we knew and had lots of memories there. It felt weird not having a plan of what to do next. It was hard for us to get our minds to understand that our home was gone and that our whole town was gone. On Saturday night, we ended up evacuating from Grandma's house. The fire had jumped the lake and the winds were really high. The fire was headed, heading our way and we wanted to be on the safe side. We stayed at a couple different houses in Chico and I was really thankful that people let us into their homes, but I was sad that we couldn't go back to our home. We were trying to find a place to rent in Chico so my dad wouldn't have a hard time getting to work, but everything was already taken. We decided to drive to Nevada and buy a bigger travel trailer. Now we live in that on a friend's property in Cohasset. We didn't have a big house before the fire. It was just two bedrooms for two adults and five kids, but now our trailer is really small, and our old house seems pretty big to think about now. But it's really nice to have our own place to be and not have to worry about where we're going to go next. Even though it's hard, I know we will get through it, and it will be okay. I mean, thank you a lot for that. I think, um, and I guess I'll speak from my own spot. When I write, I usually take an emotion or something that I haven't put on the piece of paper. And in doing so, I kind of have to experience it while I put it down on there. And um, that is, is tough to do when you're alone. And it's even more tough to do when you're in a situation like this where you're, you're, again, giving us the details of your life. And it is an amazing, profound thing that you have imparted. And I, I cannot thank you enough for sharing this on this, on this show. Um, your writing is, is fantastic. And I, I cannot wish anything but the best for you in the days coming forward. Thank you. I just want to say that was incredibly well written. I was trying to just focus on the details because I didn't want to get too emotional while listening to it. And I started to cry at first, and then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to listen to the quality of the writing here. And you did something as a writer in that piece where you engaged all of your senses and you took in your surroundings, which is what good writers do. And I think both of you did. You talked about the ashes looking like snow. You allowed yourself to still be children in those moments of just like, I'm scared, but also I'm still a kid. And I think that's really important. You're allowed to process this grief. You're doing it in a healthy way by writing. And you're also really good writers. Like, what the heck? I feel like I wasted my childhood, like, looking at you kids. I'm like, what? I need to up my game or something. I don't know. But yeah, you did something there. You engaged all your senses. You talked about what you saw, what you heard, what you could touch. And, and that's really great examples of writing and writing with high quality. And then also, I loved what you said about, like, the part where you were like, my, I knew my house wasn't burning, but everything that you knew was on fire. Like, that was such, that observation like hit me to the core. Just that, the, capturing that destruction in that line there. Because that wasn't the idea of compassion there. <coughs> it, it tied all the ideas we're talking about here about the hunter and refugees, tying the two together, and then your own experience. And, and you yourself are right there. And that was so important. And then just I love the zombie apocalypse reference. Like, <laughs> excellent, excellent. And just, yeah, both of you, you two boys, just amazing and super brave. And also just I want to say I myself write for therapeutic reasons. And this is excellent, excellent way to just get it out. In, and you will, you will survive this. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man, we have about five minutes left, and, and sometimes uh, at the end of the show, we like to ask people what, um, why they write. And, and I'm not sure we have to do that at the end of this one, because I think that's a very clear um, answer there for Honduran refugees, for imparting details about events that were, were traumatic towards us, um, recent events. And you guys have been amazing. I mean, for once, like, I'm speechless, too. 
Yeah. Uh, we've, we've had you guys, a couple of the other kids from the Butte County Homeschoolers Association on a few times. And each time I have the same question as Natalie because they have brought novels that they're writing and I'm going, I'm 25 years old. I've written a few poems. That's about all I've done. And you guys are writing amazing essays calling for social action and social justice and, and telling us um, how you see the world. And that's, those are remarkable things. Um, if I had to, to say something towards the end here, because it is towards the end, um, don't stop writing for whatever reason you guys are, are going to write. Um, because I think if I can make my own opinion on society, um, it's really formed around words <laughs> and how you can use them and, and, and wield them to, to show people things or to tell them or to ask them. Um, you guys have already shown now as you're all very young that you guys know how to do that and how to and how to reflect on events that are happening and how to empathize with people and show compassion and that's something that literally there's an entire uh degree of study on in university is called philosophy and ethics and um i know people who don't get that at all and that's something that um you guys are starting out at a very young age with and, and that's going to take you very far in life um i'm trying to figure out like a, a good little end cap for this because we have about three more minutes how about i ask a they question. Were, they were really, they were really vocal about their favorite book. Right. Yeah. Were they? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, then let's end with that. Then favorite yeah. books. You guys have a favorite book that you like. We'll start with uh, Olya. Hello, my name is Olya, and my favorite book. We're actually still reading it right now. It's pretty good so far. We're almost done, and it's called The Most Magical Girl, and it's a little bit about this girl named Annabelle and she's just her mom left her at her great aunt's house and she had to had some friends and they had to go get just they had to go find a wand to save a guy that was just kind of just trying to make the whole world his man that sounds like a complex story <laughs> very cool uh Issa what about you My name is Issa, and my favorite book would probably be The Land of Stories. And I like it because it starts out with like kids that are about my age, and then like they take on amazing adventures, and and sounds like a great story. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, what about you, Morgan? My name is Morgan, and I don't think I have a favorite book, but I have to agree with Issa. I really like The Land of Stories and The Sisters Grimm, which is The Sisters of the Brothers Grimm, and Percy Jackson, also and lots of others. I've read that series, actually. I know that very well. What about you? My name is Jonah, and I don't really have a favorite, but... Many of the ones I read include um, The 39 Clues, Percy Jackson, The Hunger Games, and Harry Potter. All right, we've got 40 seconds left. Favorite books, quick. My name is Jonas, and my favorite book, well, series is The Last Dragon Chronicles. I know that one very well. All right, Sam, what is it? My name is Sam, and I like Percy Jackson because you get to learn about Greek gods, but still like reading it. Great choices. Man, very good. <laughs> Something else? Oh, perfect. We're sharing a microphone here, so we're moving things around constantly. So if you hear squeaking, that's what it is. Well, uh, man, this is this is the last couple minutes or couple seconds of the show, I should say. And I, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been on the show, because this has been, um, as I've said earlier, uh, an experience um, for all of us here, I think. And it's you guys are wonderful, wonderful human beings, and you guys are going to do some amazing things in your life, I think. So thank you all for being here, and have a good night, everyone.